Great. So hello and welcome. My name is Jillian Bloomfield and I work for the Environmental Leadership and Training Initiative at Yale University, or LT as we call it. Uh, I'm here today with my colleague Karen Bucht, uh, who will also be facilitating this session. Uh, so LT is an initiative of Yale University School of the Environment and at the Forest School. And our program works to train and support people from all sectors and backgrounds to restore and conserve tropical forest landscapes using strategies that support biodiversity and livelihoods. So we welcome you to this information session to learn more about the Tropical Forest Landscapes online certificate program uh, and get to meet some uh, current and past participants. Uh, so the neat thing is this program engages with professionals from all over the world uh, to allow you to connect with the Yale School of the Environment, to de develop concrete skills, advance your careers, and explore science and solutions related to tropical management from different perspectives. So we're very, very pleased to be joined by three current and past participants who have come here to share their perspectives on the program and how they also approach the very practical project elements uh, of the program, which is a typical question we get from prospective applicants. So our participants today include Estefania Cortez, member of the Young Peruvians Against Climate Change at Peru. And Estefania is a current participant uh, we have Teresia Lemaco, founder and executive director of the Natural Resources Research Organization, NARESO, uh, in Tanzania, and also a part-time lecturer at the um, MS Training Center for Development Cooperation in Arusha, Tanzania. And then we have Khalil Walji, a scientist and coordinator for the Landscapes for Our Future program at the World Agroforestry Center, or ECRAF, uh, based in Nairobi, Kenya. So welcome. Uh, we've divided this presentation into three parts. First, Karen is going to present a brief program overview, and then we'll hear from our panel of participants and then open it up for questions and discussion. Uh, so some housekeeping as we progress with the information session. If you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A window, window of this Zoom webinar system, and we'll use that to uh, try to address some of your questions during the session. Uh, and if you have not already done it, we encourage you to answer the poll and we'll share the results at the end, but it helps us get an idea of what you're thinking and what would be relevant to you. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to mention that both Karen and I are program coordinators and mentors to the participants and prospective applicants like yourselves. So after the session, feel free to reach out to Karen and me, and we're happy to schedule a one-on-one -on -one call or expand on anything you learned today. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll hand it over to Karen. Great. Thank you, Jillian. I just want to say thank you to everyone for filling out the poll. It's uh, really great to see uh, there's a variety of interest here. So some of you are just learning about the program. So I hope this presentation will give you a little bit more information. And I see some of you are actually already in the application process. So that is great to see. So I'm just going to share a brief presentation of the program. Um, we have a lot more information on our website, so definitely feel free to reach out if you have additional questions. After I present, I'll also be monitoring the Q&A to see if there are any program-specific questions I can help answer. As you know, this program is Tropical Forest Landscapes Conservation, Restoration, and Sustainable Use. And this is a one year online program that consists of four thematic eight week online courses, which happen sequentially over the course of the year. The courses are fundamentals, people, strategies, and funding. And the courses aim to give you different perspectives and tools related to understanding and planning conservation and restoration initiatives. Running throughout the program, we also have our year-long capstone project course, which our uh, participants and alumni will be sharing a little bit more about their experience with this. But this course aims to give you tools and perspectives on how to really plan and um, develop a project. So throughout the course of the program, you learn about these tools, but you actually start to implement them by developing a project plan for a real life project. 
In addition to the online components, we also have an optional field course in one of our training landscapes in Latin America or Asia. Right now, over the last two cohorts, we have had to postpone this due to COVID, so the timing is a little bit uncertain, but anyone who enrolls in our program would have the option to take this field course whenever it does become offered. In terms of who this program is for, we see a number of people who work for conservation initiatives or government and geo things that are doing active conservation and restoration who take the program to help improve their work. We also see a number of students who are either current students or recently graduated looking to complement their education and really focus on tropical forest landscapes individuals who actually have land or are managing conservation restoration projects. But really the bottom line is anyone who's interested in this. So even if those top three bullet points don't fit, but you are really interested in learning more, you want to learn more about this space or you wanna make the world a better place and focus on tropical forest landscapes, this program can be a good fit. And as you can see from the charts on the right, we really have a wide range in terms of geography and sector who participate. So what you do week to week, a large part of the learning experience is through content. And so when I say content, I mean video lectures, readings, interactive presentations, and case studies. And these are from a variety of different perspectives. We have over 80 different unique contributors to content through the program. So you'll be learning from a lot of different disciplines, both academic and practical. In addition to the content, we also provide many opportunities for interaction and feedback with both your peers as well as the instructors. We do this through weekly live sessions as well as discussion forums, peer-to-peer -peer -peer exchange and opportunities for expert review. And then we also really try to encourage practical application of what you're learning. So you will learn from the content, you'll have the chance to discuss it through those interactive opportunities, but then we really want to take and apply what you're learning. So you'll have the opportunity to do this through uh, reflections in weekly forums, guided exercises, and then that personal capstone project, again, what I mentioned, is a wonderful opportunity to really build your skills and think about developing a real project. Some of the key benefits of the program, it offers a holistic perspective. So again, I mentioned we have over 80 different contributors. So you'll be learning from many different disciplines, sometimes hearing conflicting perspectives on different themes. It helps you understand the landscape, a lot of the nuance that goes into planning and developing successful initiatives, as well as develop some practical skills and learn some different tools you can implement. The program also offers an automatic access to global network. So by enrolling, you'll have already a, a community of practice of around 60 or more peers in the program, in addition to all of the different experts and instructors who will engage with you. The last key benefit I want to mention is we're really invested in your learning success. So one of the key roles of uh, myself and Jillian as program mentors is to uh, help you every step of the way. So you're not in it alone. We're here to make sure if anything is confusing or if you're having difficulties, we're here to guide you and help provide perspectives and tools to make the program work for your needs. We also try to provide a lot of flexibility. So if you are traveling or you get sick or you miss a deadline, we're here to help you figure out how to make the program work and make sure you're still able to succeed and complete the program. So what happens after the program? We are now going into our, uh, this will be our fourth year of the program. So we do have some initial stories and, and feedback from people who have completed the, the program. People have told us that they've been able to apply some of these tools they've learned to their work. In some cases, write projects or funding proposals. Some have actually implemented their capstone project. Others have included certain aspects of things they've learned in the program, like technical strategies from the strategies course or improved social inclusion based on some of the concepts they learned in our people course. Some people have used the program and actually changed positions or uh, used the program to change their field of work. So we have a number of people who are actually coming out from outside the conservation sector and really looking to um, find a way in their career to really get into something more environmentally friendly and use the program as a launch point for that. And then lastly, we have people who have gone on to start a new educational program. So if you're thinking about going on and maybe doing your studies, this is a great way to get your feet wet and kind of get back into the academic mindset. 
And we've had people who have gone on and started a master's program or PhD program. So now some of the practical aspects if you are thinking about applying. The program tuition is $6,000. This includes all of those things I mentioned, all of the coursework, the capstone project, all of the mentor support, the materials, plus a lot of additional materials, interaction with experts, as well as uh, expert advice on your assignments throughout. And then if you're interested in the field course, there is an optional fee for that. Uh, I mean, the, the optional course, there is a fee for that. Uh, we do have partial scholarships and many, many of our participants do receive these. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a bit. Some important dates, if you are thinking about applying, applications are currently open. Our early application deadline is coming up next week on March 4th. And if you are really interested in the program, we strongly encourage you to apply by then because this is how you get guaranteed review of your application. We will continue accepting applications up until April 15th, but they will be reviewed on a rolling basis. So always submitting earlier is better. Then the program will be starting on June 27th. So application requirements include our online application form. You'll need to submit an up-to-date resume, that's in English. We'll ask you to submit a personal statement and two short response statements that reflect a little bit about uh, your interests and fit for the program. You will need to submit a scanned or electronic transcript that demonstrates completion of a bachelor's degree or equivalent. For this, if you, um, if this is, in a language besides English, we will also ask that you submit translations. These can be done professionally, but you can also do them yourself if you don't have access to professional translations. And then lastly, we'll ask you to include the name and contact information of a professional reference who can provide a recommendation for you, and they will get contacted automatically through the application process. We also have some optional materials you're welcome to submit to uh, support your application. So if you've done additional coursework beyond the bachelor's degree, you are more than welcome to include that in your application, as well as if you are uh, English as a second language for you and you've done a TOEFL or another language test, you can also include these test score reports. Again, these are optional, so if you haven't done these, that is not a problem. So with the scholarships, again, these are partial scholarships and they're available on a competitive basis through the application process. Our scholarships generally cover anywhere from 25 to 75% of the tuition fee. Uh, unfortunately, we don't currently offer full tuition scholarships. If you are interested in, in being considered for a scholarship, you'll have the opportunity to do this when you complete your main application. So make sure you fill out that section before you submit. And uh, we have three different awards and you'll be asked to submit a short essay for any award you want to apply to. So we have a leadership and impact award, a career development award, and then a general award. And you can apply to up to three um, or just one or two, depending on which are a good fit for you. Because these are competitive and we only offer partial scholarships, we really do recommend that you look into external funding uh, through your employer or professional development grants. We've sometimes had individuals who partner with an organization for their capstone project and that organization has provided partial support. So uh, we do we really strongly encourage you look for options um, beyond the scholarship if you're considering um, ways to fund this program. So lastly, before I wrap up, just some application tips if you are going to apply. Be sure you review all those requirements I mentioned. You can look at those in more detail on our website and make sure you have all your materials ready to go before you start. Please contact your professional reference ahead of time. Make sure they know you're applying to this program. Make sure they know the deadlines and that they have consented to having a uh, being your recommender for the program because we aren't able to review the application before this reference comes in. So you wanna make sure they're aware and they're ready to go as well. And then pay attention to that essay requirement. This is really where our application committee gets to know you, gets to know why you're interested in the program. And um, this is your opportunity to really shine as an applicant. So uh, pay special attention to that. And um, we really enjoy using that as a way to get to know the diversity of applicants who are interested in applying. Lastly, if you have questions or run into technical issues with the application, you can always reach out to us at tropicalcertificate at yale.edu, and we're happy to help at any stage in the application process. So with that, uh, again, the priority deadline is next week, March 4th, and I strongly encourage you to visit our website. There's a lot more detail on all of the different things like 
covered there. And again, you can always email us for questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and end there. Um, I will also be monitoring the Q&A as we go for any sort of program specific questions that are not going to go towards our alumni and I'll be trying to answer those in the chat tool. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Karen. Uh, so now we'll have the chance to hear from our panel of participants, uh, Estefania, Teresia, and Khalil. Uh, so first we'll have introductions. Uh, then we'll hear more about the capstone projects of each participant and then hear their advice for prospective applicants like yourself. Uh, so our first guest is Estefania Cortes, uh, who is a current participant in the program. Uh, Estefania uh, enrolled in June 2021 and is a member of the Young Peruvians Against Climate Change group and has been focusing her capstone work on community and natural ecosystem well-being through forest conservation in Peru. Uh, so, Estefania, firstly, we'd love to hear from you a bit about yourself, what brought you to the program, and what you're getting out of it so far. Hi. Hi, Gillian. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much again for inviting me to share some of my, my experience. Uh, like Gillian said, I am currently uh, still in the program. So I'm um, in the last course that um, Karen was mentioning about, the funding uh, course. I am a Peruvian lawyer. I am currently based in Finland now. I'm pursuing my master's in environmental law here. And uh, what brought me really to this course is a bit of luck, a bit of uh, the whole COVID uh, context and my curiosity to get back into this path that I was uh, really interested uh, like a couple of years ago. And um, I wasn't really able to develop or to uh, go further with that. Uh, at the time last year, I was still working within the agribusiness sector and um, I remember talking to you several times, Julian, because I was kind of afraid of how um, how I was supposed to uh, juggle uh, with the work, uh, the masters that I just got in, and uh, this program. And obviously, I didn't want it to miss the opportunity uh, of getting the insight, like Karen said, of uh, being able to really grasp more. Um, about conservation and restoration, which I'm not actively part of. I think that's very important to mention because um, like Karen said, like this program may be more appealing to people that want to get their projects, their individual ideas moving. Um, but like me, you can have less of experience even in the technical concepts uh, and basis to really come up with a project, a new idea. Um, and in my case, and I will talk about it later, my project is in Peru. So the challenge was, how am I going to develop this project while being abroad? Um, what I'm getting so far right now, it's, well, I actually made a list because there's a lot of things that are helping me not only um, to fulfill this desire of trying to get back on track and, and to figure out more about conservation and restoration while I'm doing, I'm still studying the masters, but to just keep an open mind about different perspective, which is basically what Karen said. Um, this program really challenged you in every way. You, I mean, I, I can have some strengths in some of the courses, but when it comes to me as a lawyer uh, with maybe not as much basis in the ecological or even finance um, topics, it really pushes you to keep reading the amazing uh, library available of Yale, uh, keep looking at the video lectures, being present one hour of the week, which is amazing and it's actually doable. 
um, and I say it as a person that's been doing three things at the same time. Um, so I think it really, for me, is giving me this really big overview of what conservation is. It's confirming me what I actually thought and what I want to pursue after this um, program. A huge amount of new concepts and new, a very big um, idea and, and about scientific and, and technical guidance in itself. And of course, meeting amazing experts from around the world with different projects and colleagues from, from the whole cohort that are just willing to give you feedback and talk to you outside of the program, which is amazing. Wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. And you're right. A year ago, we were talking one-on-one -on -one to figure out how would the program work with your schedule and with your travel plans, everything. I'll put in the chat, uh, you can schedule a one-on-one -on -one call with Karen or with me similarly to discuss, you know, if you are interested in the program, but you're struggling trying to figure out how it would work for you, um, we can, we're happy to arrange a call. Um, so. Yeah, thank you for sharing your kind words. Um, next, we'll hear from Teresia, uh, who's an alumnus of the program. Uh, she was enrolled from June 2020 to May 2021. Uh, Teresia is founder and executive director of Nat the Natural Resources Research Organization uh, and a part-time lecturer in uh, Arusha, Tanzania. And she focused her capstone project on women empowerment through forest landscape restoration in Tanzania. So Teresa, we'd love to hear a bit about yourself, your experience in the program and your perspective nine months later. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh. Okay, thank you, Jillian. I was saying, uh, I'm going through the four points of only introduction. Uh, the four points. All right. Okay, thank you. And uh, welcome the participants. I'm Dr. Teresa Olemako from Tanzania, Africa, and I can see a number of people from Zambia. Uh, you're most welcome. Uh, I did this program LT in 2020, 2021, and uh, I'm the founder and executive produce, uh, executive uh, director for a local research organization called the Natural Resource Research Organization, NARESO, which is based in Arusha, Tanzania. And also I'm a part-time lecturer and academic manager at the MS Training Center for Development Cooperation in Arusha. Uh, it's under Action Aid Denmark, uh, which is working with uh, civil society organization training, as well as uh, uh, we offer bachelor's degree in governance and leadership, as well as master's degree. So I'm the academic manager there, but also uh, I've been appointed as a result of this LT pro, uh, uh, program. Uh, I've been appointed as the author, lead author, under the IPBS, I don't know if you know, Intergovernmental uh, Science Policy Platform, Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. This is organized under UNEP, FAO, UNDP, and UNESCO. So I'll be leading, writing the chapter one uh, in all the initiative, which is about three years initiative up to 2024. So I was nominated this year in January 2022. But the result is um, it's a combination of uh, the work I've been doing after completing this LT certificate program. So that's about me. And um, what have I, uh, what am I, did I get out of the program and what is happening right now? First of all, when I joined the program, I was working with the Worldwide Fund, uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature, 
WWF at the regional office, which was covering East Africa, uh, all the East African countries, which are now seven countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi, Congo, and uh, Mozambique and Madagascar. And my main work with, under the regional forest program was to address the issue of illegal timber trade in the East Africa region and the Southern Africa region. So when I joined the LT certificate program, I didn't have the background of forest. I was just a conservationist. My background is from wildlife and, uh, and rural development. So joining LT program in 2020, actually added a lot of knowledge on forestry and uh, changed my perspective in life. And when I finished this, uh, we finished this program last year, 2021, then I finished my contract with the WWF in September. And then in October, I started focusing in my own local research organization, uh, organization which is Nareso, and we do a lot of stuff on uh, forest landscape restoration, especially for women and youth. And uh, uh, my project was about uh, gender, uh, women empowerment through forest landscape restoration in Mkomazi, Tanzania. And uh, what I do now in Nare, so we have Innovation Lab. That Innovation Lab we are trying to see the sustainable use of the forestry product from the timber and non-timber forest products. So we, were, uh, we have a number of products we are trying to uh, develop right now because I started last year, uh, end of last year with COVID, things have been happening slowly. But what we are trying to do, the products we are going to sell in the local market in the trade fair in July, 2022 this year, but also we are looking for a uh, neighbor market also in Kenya, Tanzania, uh, Uganda, and other neighboring countries within the East Africa. So we have products like honey, we have uh, wooden carvings. I think you know those uh, wooden carvings which you find in the tourist souvenir shops. Also, we have candles, we have uh, we are trying to do training to women on how to do food processing from the forest products like mangoes, like tamarind. So all those uh, that training is being offered under Nareso as a local uh, research organization. But not only that, uh, while we do those initiatives, we are also trying to do a research where we started that we started with women with no knowledge and then thereafter, we'll try to evaluate uh, what is the impact of our training of our products uh, to women and youth in increasing income, but at the same time, adding value to their livelihoods, which are, is the whole aspect of forest landscape restoration. Uh, to me, this program actually changed my life. And uh, when I started the program, I used to understand that Forest landscape restoration is just about planting trees. Then I came to realize it's not only about planting trees, it's the whole uh, package of promoting livelihoods, protecting uh, forest, promoting conservation, and also in totality is where you can achieve the overall goal of the forest landscape restoration. So, uh, that is it, and also my, uh, under this project, uh, what I achieved is uh, I'm publishing a book on our initiative under Forest Landscape Restoration, and once it's out, I will share with our uh, LT network, global network, and see this is the result and this is the product of a certificate program, which I was not even, I said, I was not expecting on forestry but I learned within a year and it has changed my life not only my life but I'm contributing to promote women youth uh, in the angle of uh, forestry conservation uh, what we did uh, with our Komazi project we came to realize that we need to raise funding 
So right now I'm submitting a funding for those who know the Global Ecosystem Based Adaptation Fund. It's based in German office. And uh, we had a call for proposal from 50,000 US dollars to 200,000 US dollars. So I'm applying first, I applied for 50,000 USD dollar and we'll submit this month. And uh, we we'll use this funding for seed capital for promoting our innovation labs, coming out with the pro, uh, products. And also we learned a lot under this course on financial aspects of fundraising, project management. Uh, we had courses on climate change and actually this funding is specific, uh, specific on climate change. So this is our first initiative, uh, uh, dear participants, and I'm very uh, positive that we are going to get this funding and it will help us to promote this innovation lab and uplift the poor, especially the women and the, and the youth in Tanzania. So in our organization, we have volunteers programs. So anybody who can join and wish to come to Tanzania, Arusha, please welcome. And uh, we welcome to you to our office. We have tried to build our own office. Uh, it's based in, uh, it's not in town, but in rural areas near the Arusha National Park, where we have also a forest reserve, Mount Meru Forest Reserve. So actually most of our activities, our field work, we send our participants to uh, forest reserves near the Arusha National Park. Most welcome, and if you have any volunteers program, please welcome. So about the insight, what should I say about the LT certificate program? Uh, one thing I learned and actually I'm implementing is, uh, uh, I should say that every individual effort count in the contribution of forest landscape restoration initiatives. And that's why I really focus to empower women as individuals youth as individuals because in order to reach those hectares which was set aside in different countries for FLRA initiative for example in Tanzania we committed 5.2 million hectares but uh, to achieve that uh, that is every individual effort count in the process and uh, it's not about a certain organization but we need to build the culture and teach the people to value their resources, to value their forest, and at the end, we'll be able to achieve uh, our goal for the forest landscape restoration initiatives. And also, uh, under that insight, that indigenous local knowledge is key to achieve sustainable results. So, people learn what they know, use their local knowledge, and then promote what they learn in LPT certificate. Then from there, all that as a package, you can test uh, degraded lands and uh, deforestation in deforested area. Um, so I want to do one introduction, an, another introduction to Khalil, and then we'll do the slide sharing. All right. Does that work? So thank you, participants, and welcome to Arusha, Tanzania, Africa. <laughs> thank you, Teresa. It's so inspiring hearing the how uh, well, all the amazing work that you and your NGO and everybody are doing and then how it related to so many different aspects of the certificate program. So thanks again for sharing. Um, now I want to hand it off to Khalil Walji, who's an alum, also an alumnus, uh, enrolled in, he enrolled in the certificate program uh, from June 2020 to May 2021. Uh, he's a scientist and coordinator of the landscapes for our future program at the World Agroforestry Center, ECRAF, in Nairobi, Kenya. And he focused his capstone project on a restoration initiative 
uh, in Uganda. So same question for you, Khalil. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself, your experience in the program and your perspective nine months later? Wonderful. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, uh, Karen and Julian, for the invitation. It's really nice to be back in the Zoom setting with colleagues from the LT program. Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful year uh, joining weekly, so nice to see some familiar faces. Um, yeah, so I was already introduced. My name is Khalil Walji, and uh, I'm, I'm currently serving as coordinator and, and uh, scientist at uh, ECRAF. Um, but at the time of the program, I was actually working uh, with the Food and Agricultural Organization in Rome, and I see a few colleagues on the call from there as well. Um, I guess more broadly, I'm an ecologist, I'm a trained soil scientist, um, a wildlife enthusiast, a hiker. <laughs> um, so there's a number of terms I could use to describe myself, uh, but I guess I'm just excited to be a panelist today and I'm already seeing some really interesting questions uh, in the chat. Uh, some questions that I, I had as sort of a working professional who, who thought about taking this program. And uh, so I'm really excited to dive into some of those. I know Karen's already answered, but I think it'd be also be great for some of the panelists to kind of uh, share some of our thoughts. I mean, I think it's challenging uh, to try to do school and balance that with our personal lives and our professional lives. But I think this program really does a wonderful job of um, allowing the flexibility for us to um, explore the knowledge when we like and, and engage and, and tap some of the mentors when it, it's, it's uh, when, when it's, uh, convenient for us. Of course, there's a baseline of, of sort of effort that's required to kind of move through the program. But I really, uh, I, I was, I was, uh, was certainly pleased. But I was also encouraged by how the program was set up to allow for professionals to um, to really uh, benefit from the program. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about myself. Um, let's see, what was the second question? I think what did I get out of the program? Uh, is that right? Julie? Yeah. Okay. Great. So yeah, I, I already mentioned. I think when I um, when I enrolled in the program, I wasn't at ECRAF, I was uh, in Rome at, at FAO and you know, I was really working uh, a little, uh, you know, the context of my work was different. I was working sort of in a, in a more international governance setting, uh, more working on more normative work. It's a bit of a jargon term, but sort of voluntary guidelines. Effectively, the work was not context specific and was often out of the ecological context and wasn't really place-based, right? I mean, it, it was working at sort of headquarters. Uh, and I learned a tremendous, tremendous amount while I was there. Uh, but I think I was craving, uh, you know, my background is from more of a research background and working with farmers in fields and a specific landscape. And, and so I was craving moving back to that context. Um, and so I think what the LT program offered right away, or I think what enticed me um, was that was an opportunity to join a community of, of conservation practitioners. Uh, and, and I say that um, lightly, I say that knowing that many of the people that joined the LT program aren't actually conservation practitioners yet. Many are looking to uh, also pivot careers at some point. They want to learn a little bit more about conservation. They want to learn a little bit more about restoration. They want to pivot their career. Uh, some, some of them, you know, some of them are maybe like me, people who um, felt a little bit daunted and, and not sure if they wanted to pursue a PhD, but still wanted to be studying something and kind of, you know, joining a community of practice. And so I think there, you know, um, all of that was very uh, enticing for me as a young professional. I, I wanted to um, uh, jo join a group of, of like-minded people who were thinking in the same way and, and wanted to kind of move in the same direction and vet ideas together and throw ideas around. And I think that's what I found um, through the LT program. Um, I think one of what, you know, that, uh, I, I went on a run this morning and really had to think about this. I think for maybe Estefania, some of these, uh, some of these things are maybe a little bit more fresh. Uh, for myself, I had to go back and kind of look at my capstone course and remember, try to remember uh, some of the things that really came out for me. But there were, there were three kind of major things that, um, uh, rose to the top as I was trying to reflect on my time in the LT program. The, the first one was um, there's a the, the program does a wonderful job of onboarding people of, uh, of of who are either experts in their fields but also very broad generalists. And I think um, even the other two panelists have spoken about maybe how they haven't they, they weren't necessarily ecologists or restoration practitioners in the past. Um, and I think that that's a strength of the program, right? That there's a very strong sort of fundamentals program to begin with. And what that means is that the, the group of people that you'll engage with are human geographers and anthropologists and their uh, ethnobotanists. And, and that diversity of perspectives really brings another element to the program that I think is very valuable and is something that I really uh, benefited from. You know, at the end of the day, uh, I work in landscapes and landscapes have a diversity of experiences, which all need to be um, uh, weighed up and sort of counteracted with our worldview and how we want to balance trade-offs in those landscapes. And uh, this program was, was a wonderful opportunity to test that as, as well in the health program. So there was a, there was a, there was a lovely component of, of a diversity of, of, of perspectives that I, I, I really valued. Um, 
I, I think the, the the second thing was was and I think it's very basic, but I think it was really valuable. Was sometimes as we move through our professional careers, you kind of lose that community to bounce ideas off and share information with. And I think with LT at the end of the day, you move to the program, but you do create a new community of of sort of scholars or new community of of like-minded practitioners who are willing to, you know, look through your work, peer review your work, help you kind of move along and almost in sort of an innovator, innovation lab kind of perspective. And um, I really valued that as well. So yeah, just a few things I, I uh, jotted down uh, in my phone as I was running this morning. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and I'll turn it back to Julian. I know he has some, some more prompts and uh, maybe I'll answer some questions in the Q&A as well. Thank you, Khalil. Uh, and definitely, it's so neat to hear your perspectives on, on the program and especially meeting all the different, the people with the very different backgrounds and keeping in touch too. Um, you guys are now nine months out of the program or so and are still very active in the WhatsApp group that we have for the program or um, we haven't had, there haven't been that many in-person activities, but a few of you have met up at conferences or um, other events in person and I believe that'll increase more even as the pandemic winds down. So that's nice to see. Uh, Karen mentioned earlier that a major component of the certificate program is the capstone project. Uh, and so from moment one, the participants are encouraged to think about how the content you're learning applies to a specific landscape or region. Uh, and so I want to give you guys a chance to talk about the project uh, to, so that the participants on our call can have a sense of what is a real project that someone worked on. Um, so I think we'll go in a slightly different order. Uh, the second time, we'll, this time we'll start with you, Khalil, and go uh, back to uh, in the other direction. Oh, you're muted. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Sorry, I'm going to try and find the screen sharing button here. Sorry. Sure. And we want to be pretty brief with this part. So, uh, Karen's still commenting on yeah. questions in the chat, um, but uh, we want to make sure to get to a couple out loud. Oh, great. Can you see my screen or is it the, uh, the we comments? We see the, the comments. <laughs> is that better? Yes. Okay, great. So yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I think it was mentioned uh, a few times already. I think the capstone really for me was actually the fundamental part of the program. So obviously there's an academic and sort of a thematic uh, component to the program where you're learning about, you know, what's the mo most contemporary uh, papers and knowledge on restoration and, and sort of climate justice and carbon sequestration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, for me, when I approached the project, when I, when I approached the program, um, I was actually in, in the process of actually looking at sort of more formalized project management certificate programs, such as the PRINCE or the PMP. Um, and what I found is as I moved through my career as a young professional, now only being five, six years in, I was really craving skills on how to plan, develop uh, uh, projects, how to apply for funding, how to implement, and then monitor and evaluate those programs throughout. So um, I'll talk a little bit about my actual project, but um, I think there are two types of um, people who go into the LT program and they use the capstone differently. Some are those who have a place-based conservation project and are looking to vet it and look for funding and actually implement it. Um, and I'm in the latter group, which you know I applied sort of a, a theoretical uh, project. Um, of course, it was grounded in, in a place that I have been and spent time. So I, I did my project on Lake Mburu. Uh, national Park in uh, in Uganda. It's a place I've visited a number of times as a, as a child as well, uh, but it's got a long history of conservation challenges. Uh, it's had conservation projects in the park for over 50 years um, and has some ethnic and tribal challenges as well. So it's an interesting place to um, apply the tools that the LT program provides. Um, I would because I think what's more important and maybe is more valuable for some of the uh, the people who are applying, some of the colleagues on the call, um, is, is that whole exercise. I found the, the, the exercise of trying to think through uh, root cause analysis, trying to think through SWOT analysis, threat analysis, trying to develop a theory of change around uh, underlying factors, uh, develop interventions that not only lead to uh, uh, outcomes, but also lead to longer term sustainable impacts, trying to think through you know, developing an evaluation and monitoring framework and, and I'm saying all these things just to highlight really the sheer number of tools that I think the LT program walks you through. Um, they provide it in sort of a, a modular approach. And then not only that, you get feedback on what you develop, you know, from Jillian and, and Karen, but also through, you know, the Yale School uh, professors. And I think that's a valuable exercise. So, you know, irrespective of what I studied and where I did it, um, you know, really, I think the value that I found from the program was having, you know, a, a new list and a methodology for a number of really important 
uh, components of a project application implementation and monitoring and evaluation that I think is, has already served me. I was actually, when I was with FAO, we were putting together a, a, a proposal for the USA, which you can see at the bottom of my slide here says it was the BAA for 2001 or 2021. So, you know, even though I wasn't applying, you know, I was applying the tools in a theoretical way for the, the capstone course itself, I found the tools themselves much more valuable for everything else I was doing for a donor you know, for a donor application for big funding through bilateral funding and, and uh, uh, other funding streams as well. So um, yeah, I'll apologize. I don't know if I, if I was the best person to start with Julian because I didn't talk about my project at all, but I just found this kind of value. So I'll stop there and back. Thanks, Khalil. And I think that's great because um, like you said, there are participants who come to the program with a specific project that they are working on for their jobs or their personal lives. And then there are people who do it more as a um, hypothetical exercise. And in either case, it's really about the skill building. Uh, and so that was, I think it was a great way to start out. Um, so thank you. Uh, Tracy, would you like to share your slide? Okay, let me share. I have only one slide. Let me share. Great. In the meantime, while you get that up, um, Karen's been answering some key questions in the chat, which is wonderful. And then we'll also send those out as uh, kind of frequently asked questions uh, to you all afterwards to uh, take a look at those answers. I think if you go back one. Can you see? We see the, it says end of slideshow, but um, if you click back, you might be able to go or you might just have, there you go. Okay. All right. I think you can read the title there. Yeah. Um, okay. So, uh, so that is my, uh, I was the LT certificate participant from 2020, 2021. And my capstone project was about women empowerment through forest landscape restoration in Mkomazi, uh, Tanzania. You can see there the picture of Mkomazi. Uh, it's mostly savanna woodland ecosystem uh, with major two key species of wildlife, uh, rhino, black rhinos and elephant. So those are the key species in the ecosystem. And below is the picture of where we uh, we normally meet. This is the village office with the village government. And that is where I presented my project. And uh, we agreed thereafter, after completing the certificate program, then is where we can start our initiative. And as I said earlier, we applied for a global EBA fund, Ecosystem Based Adaptation Fund, uh, USD $50,000 as a seed capital for innovative approaches. And this will be done our, under our uh, local research organization, NARESO uh, Innovation Lab. And it's about climate change. And uh, we submitted this uh, February. But uh, taking you back on what was just briefly, quickly, on what was about the uh, my Capstone project. I did it in Mkomazi because uh, I was working with the communities living adjacent to Mkomazi National Park. Mkomazi National Park has a lot of problems related to wildlife, uh, human wildlife conflicts, especially elephants, crop raiding, human injuries, because elephants go to the farms eat the maize and or whatever is planted there. The problem is in that uh, there is no buffer zone between the national park and the village living adjacent. All the area which was set aside as a buffer zone has been, uh, been this encroachment where people have built the houses. The, how can we restore the buffer zone? By 
planting trees along the boundaries, but at the same time, along the hives for honey production, that is a women project, and also trying to promote agroforests within individual farms so that they can have trees where they can collect firewood and also they can have other products from the forest like the fruits. So my main, my project uh, uh, focused on buffer plantations, honey production and the agroforestry Thank you. Uh, initiative. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that I think briefly that is it. Yeah, and uh, lastly, one minute, uh, Gillian, we do uh, tree nurseries with the conservation clubs in Nareso. We offer the products as you see from the wood, uh, wood products, honey production, and this is our organization. You can visit our website at www.nareso.org. Thank you so much and welcome. Uh, so I should stop share. Okay. Thank you. And uh, again, um, you're welcome to put in the chat the, the links to your, all your projects, uh, Teresa. I'm sure the attendees would be interested in, in connecting with you all. Okay. And then uh, we have a few minutes left. I want to give the opportunity to Estefania to share a little bit about your project as well. Yes, I will be very fast. Um, okay. Can I share? Share screen. Hmm. Give me a second. Sure thing. And for any of you watching this uh, on uh, either Facebook Live or on YouTube, uh, we're, uh, some of the questions have to do with some of the things the participants have already answered, like uh, aspects of how they've balanced uh, this program with their other jobs. But if you're interested in discussing that more, feel free to reach out to Karen or to me, and we can also uh, direct your questions to some current and past participants. The screen share working? I think not. I can, I mean, I can still. Yeah, why don't you just to... describe very briefly yes. what it is that you've been focusing on as a current participant. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and also try to reply to some, I know the questions in the Q&A are mostly about the capstone um, as a current and also kind of busy uh, student uh, this, this first semester. I can tell you that it can't be done, which I think is the main thing. Um, my capstone, it's actually focused on a particular landscape in Peru, uh, which is the, a forest. Um, it is in a hotspot in Peru, which is considered one of the places with most um, amount and variety of biodiversity in the world. So it really caught my eye since the, moment, the first moment. Um, I wasn't that confident about the amount of information, which I recall talking about it more with Karen uh, a few times. Um, because as you know, when you're trying to design a project, what are you most careful with is the amount of information that you can actually put in. Uh, as a non-practitioner uh, of conservation, um, it was difficult for me to decide if going for a project of a non-tropical -lands non landscape or this project that really uh, captured my eye. <laughs> um, and it was a very ambitious one. So my project, it's about more of a linkage between the community that lives uh, nearby in the, in the community, is the community of Santiago de Carampoma, uh, which is, as a community, they are owners of this forest, the forest of Japani. 
So my vision for the for the project um, is to basically have this endemic um, biodiversity and a clear representative sample of the tropical Andes biodiversity, which is uh, this forest, um, and try to push for a private conservation area um, sustainably managed by the community of Caramboma itself. Uh, so you can actually nurture both natural resources of the forest, soil, water, and climate, as well as the anthropogenic values of the site, which uh, range between medicinal plants and also archeological sites. So as a project, it really has a lot of elements to itself, which I kind of needed to adapt. Uh, if I can say one insight from, from the capstone in itself is that you really need to adapt, which each exercise you kind of leave stuff and also you kind of get in another uh, type of components that you didn't really think at the beginning of the design. So you need to be willing to let go of some perspectives that are not actually helping you to the ultimate goal. And I think that's a major breakthrough for me at least. Um, and Dr. Amy, uh, Amy Beather that helps us with this capstone project like each kind of each week with the exercise. Um, I think it required for me to be a lot more open-minded and uh, also be willing to modify again and again and again, all of my strategies, all of my action plans. So what you really get to see each time you submit a particular assignment uh, specifically for the capstone project, it's not gonna be perfect. It's not gonna be um, like uh, you're a professional conservationist uh, in itself, at least not for me, uh, but you get this deep feedback that I truly uh, appreciate because I know it's a feedback for each of the participants. And I think at the end, uh, since now we're on the last course and the budgeting um, component, it's, I have not sent it, I know Jillian, <laughs> I will, um, but I think it really, uh, with each feedback, you kind of, um, I don't know, maybe for Teresa and also to Khalil, like the first exercise of the capstone, it really maybe not related at all with the last one or with the last strategy that you push uh, at the last moment. So I think to adapt and to have this open mindset and be willing to play with that theoretical uh, project, or in my case, I, I was actually um, talking to a specific NGO that deals with uh, distortive landscapes. So in my case, I had a partial view and information, but I know that in my cohort, some of my peers are actually working with um, non-existent um, projects. So, I mean, I think you can really be creative and that is also one of the things that I think the capstone and the program itself uh, gives you. Um, and it's a very cool asset uh, of the program. Thank you so much, Estefania. Uh, so I wanna send a huge thank you to our uh, participants and alumni who came to the session. We've just about reached our time. I put in the chat a bunch of different links uh, so that you guys can take a look at some things. Um, I'll also share on the screen for just a second. 
to keep in mind that, again, the priority deadline is March 4th coming up, and then the final deadline will be April 15. Uh, you can visit our website for a lot of information, uh, our email address to ask us any questions related to the application process or the uh, program in general, or even questions about some of the different things that our speakers have said today. Um, you can sign up for our mailing list to get information and updates uh, about the program. Uh, as uh, Estefania mentioned multiple times, we have this option to speak one-on-one -on -one with a program mentor, uh, and we can guide you with your application. And then it's an example of how we're with you every step of the way during the program. And so you can sign up for a time to have a call with Karen or with myself. Uh, we also have some free lectures available to you. Um, I put in the chat the link. Uh, we LT recently launched a Coursera course, which is a self-paced uh, short uh, program. Uh, and it's only a snapshot of the content available in the broader certificate program, but it gives you a preview of a few of the lectures that are included in the broader program. And then uh, with that, uh, we hope you all stay in contact. Uh, we hope you stay safe and healthy. Again, do not hesitate to contact us. And we were really, really grateful for our participants and alumni, uh, Khalil, Teresa, uh, Estefania, for coming here today and sharing uh, so much about your perspective uh, and your projects. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Yeah, thank you. Bye.